most of the people know, as almost everyone knows, like theoretical physics is quite hard, and quantum physics is especially hard. What uh, would you like to do after the PhD? Do you have some ideas about that? Yep. Are you going? I'm going. Are we rolling? We are rolling. Hi guys, my name is Andrea. I come from Italy. Uh, I particularly come from Verona. My name is Case. Uh, I'm originally from Canada. Hi, my name is Tan Xing and I'm a CJSDSR based at Hong Kong University of Berlin. My name is Manuel and I'm a PhD student at the Queen Mary University of London. I'm Sebastian Pöger. Uh, I'm originally from Germany. I am in my tiny little Paris apartment, working from home. We are here in my office in the World for Mathematica building in Champagne. I am a student of particle physics. Stefan De Andres, this is the first video where I introduced myself. My name is Nicolai Pagli, I'm from France. My name is uh, Davide and I am an Italian physicist. My name is Luke. My name is Lorenzo. I'm Ricardo. And I'm Anna. The rules of the game are I tell you the name of the diagram and you have to draw it and try to get it correctly. Okay? So, ready guys? Sure. Wonderful. Let's let's start easy. A tadpole. What? Tadpole. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the systems that we want to study have really deep structures and contain complicated objects that we fully do not understand. Now we get to the bubble. In order to tackle these kind of problems, what often is done is try to simplify the problem. Next easiest one, triangle. QCD is the theory of quarks and gluons, which are fundamental particles that we know exist in nature. The scattering amplitudes of QCD basically explain how these particles gluons and quarks interact with one another. These amplitudes basically form the theoretical foundation of uh, what happens at collider experiments or experiments like the LHC uh, in CERN. Next one, the box. When particles collide into each other, many things can happen. Their energy can be converted into new particles and each particle can go into a different direction. Each of these outcomes has its own probability and we mathematically compute this probability through something called the amplitude. Let's go for a ladder. <laughs> That's stairs, not ladder, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, still, but still a good try. <laughs> yeah, ladder looks really like a ladder. So the kind of area I focus on is I look at a very specific scattering amplitude that's known to have a uh, very special type of symmetry called dual conformal symmetry. So I'm doing some calculations, I'm running some numerical simulations, and I'm basically just trying to put together a story of the symmetry properties of a very specific uh, scattering amplitude called uh, the box. So it's a very mathematical thing. I myself am mainly motivated by the math and the kind of symmetry and the beauty. Um, and uh, that keeps me happy. The way in which I do physics, for me, it's not a work. I'm a physicist and uh, it happens that I'm working for academia right now, but I will be a physicist regardless. Me being a PhD, me being a postdoc or uh, whatever. It's really something that defines my way of seeing things around me, the way also in which I interact with people, and it's subtle in the sense that uh, I don't even realize it.
When I first started studying physics, I was impressed, shocked to realize that uh, nature is a, a unique thing in the sense that uh, uh, several phenomena that can appear different uh, in reality, they are nothing else than the manifestation of a unique entity. And this entity is an underlying equation, which has also hidden beauty, a hidden simplicity. Why I decided to do physics, in particular theoretical physics? My encounter with physics was uh, quite random. Uh, I remember that I just entered into um, bookshop and I found this book of uh, Walter Isaacson uh, about uh, Einstein, it was his biography. Um, I started to read it uh, just by myself, randomly, and I got so excited about what I um, was reading at that time that I decided that um, I would do physics uh, for my future. It has been like Alice's Wonderland. I got amazed about the world in which we are living. Now, that my time and the time of an observer of uh, one of these ducks, for example, which are moving with a certain velocity with respect to me, they have a different time compared to mine. So time is relative. And this is something that has been found by Albert Einstein. And every time that I think about it, this is so amazing. This is exciting because it tells us something that with our own eyes and with our simple intuitions, we cannot understand. Of course, we can understand it, but we have to use mathematics and we have to use uh, logic, and that's what brings Einstein to his theory of relativity. I'm now in freezing Chicago visiting my supervisor JJ um, because he moved here from Paris. Uh, so, what we're doing now is we've been trying to work on a project that I've been stuck with for about two months where I've been trying to sew together two tree amplitudes to find a loop amplitude and as it turns out I may have been using the wrong tree amplitudes so what we're doing now is we're taking about 40 seconds sorry 47 steps back and trying to generate our own tree amplitudes which I guess is how research works working on um, how quantum particles interact via uh, exchanging of gravitons. So how uh, gravity can be seen in a quantum theory perspective. I'm working on how I can describe uh, the interactions of black holes and the gravitational waves that they emit. Of course the ultimate goal is to understand the laws that uh, describe the universe. But right now uh, my project is uh, a bit more targeted. Uh, I'm writing a piece of software that can solve a very specific class of equations called the partial linear difference equations. By integrating out and thus removing some degrees of freedom from a problem, which in this case is a stop core blue, reduce it to a simpler form factor calculation in an effective field theory setting. I'm working on constraining uh, Feynman integrals using something called Yangian symmetry, which is very close to, closely related to um, integrability. One example of a Feynman diagram which uh, is integrable is the, the one-loop box integral, which I've been studying quite a lot. Uh, there is a connection between gravitational theories and its corresponding non-abelian gauge theories. In some sense, uh, gravity theories is the double copy of the corresponding non-abelian gauge theory. The study of the radiation in a binary system of two celestial objects. I work on something called the duality between color and kinematics. We can relate the color factors of these graphs in this simple way. This means that instead of having three independent graphs, we actually have two independent color factors. Now it turns out that we can actually do the same thing for the kinematic part of an amplitude. Scattering surrounds us in our everyday lives. When sunlight reflects off a shop window, water drops bounce off the car windscreen, or when two billiard balls collide. These kinds of phenomena also occur with particles as small as electrons and astronomical objects as big as black holes. But with black holes and electrons, it is not quite so simple. When assuming they are independent before and after the collision, the mathematical prediction gives unphysical numbers, even infinity, and this has to be dealt with somehow. 
My research focuses on how this problem um, can be solved by imagining soft clouds of infinitely many particles around the scattered object, making them feel each other even when they are far apart. There was a time in which the explanation of the world was based mainly on the intuition. Nowadays we are far from there. After the arrival of quantum mechanics, the physical world is becoming far from what we can guess or what we can only think. Uh, what is light, for example, under some circumstances it behaves as a particle and under other circumstances it behaves as a wave. But what it is the light, uh, the reality is that it is not a particle and it is not a wave. But the light is something new that we actually don't know. We can start with the question, we can, but we cannot have a concept of the light which is intuitive. To describe the quantum mechanics, we have to use a new vocabulary. We use uh, toy models, which are playgrounds where math is more simple. Since the real world is too much complicated, theoretical physicists have to do some approximation. In our case, we have to approximate the universe itself. We put away our universe and we come back with a new theory, a new universe that behaves similarly to our world. And the goal now is understanding completely this time model, this new theory, and then come back to the real world once we have understood completely this theory. So we can come back uh, stronger than before and then try to understand also our universe. Hi guys. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? And uh, I would like to ask you something about what you're doing, uh, just uh, general things. Uh, and what is in common between uh, motion of planets, uh, black holes and uh, elementary particles? So, first of all, when we are talking about general relativity and the motion of black holes, we're talking about physics on a large scale, very big distances. And that we call classical physics. Uh, scattering amplitudes describe uh, interactions in quantum physics, in quantum field theory. And what does that mean? That means that we're talking about interactions on very, very small scales. So, what do these things have in common? Well, basically, quantum field theory doesn't only describe interactions on a small scale. It describes interactions on every scale up to extremely small scales, which means that it's also capable of describing these really big scales. So in physics, most of our theories are what we call effective theories. This means that they only work on a certain scale. So if we want to describe something the size of an apple, for example, we're going to use Newton's laws. But Newton's laws don't help you much if you're dealing with really, really small particles. Then we need to use quantum theory. And if you're using really big particles, say black holes, then you need to use general relativity. So these are theories that aren't wrong, they're just connected to a certain length scale or a certain size. Now what we find is that if we take these teeny tiny particles, the tiniest particles we know, which we need quantum field theory to describe, and we smash them together, and we take this expression and we square it, then we actually get the same expression we would get from colliding two of these big black holes. And this is called the double uh, copy property. And what this means is that we can actually use the same physics or the same expressions to express the very smallest things we have as the very largest things we have. And this has to mean that we've discovered something fundamental about the universe or something fundamental about how we can describe all of the physics at once. So Ingrid, could you tell us why you decide to study physics? I liked physics in high school. My grandfather was a mathematician at the University of Oslo. He was the person that was the most excited about what he did and where he worked that I've ever known. Mm -hmm. The last years of school, you get to start choosing things mm -hmm. and you have to make a more active choice. And if your teacher's good, I, I, I think that's where it starts. Uh -huh. Also, because after that, physics becomes cool. 
uh, the, the music you have in school is very uh, flawed and it's just, it doesn't right, really right, explain right, anything. Right, right, right. So you need, you need a good teacher to throw you into university physics. Mm -hmm. And by that time, the physics itself is so cool that you just keep going. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Amplitudes can be computed as something like the volume of a geometrical object called the amplitohedron. My research focuses on using the amplitohedron to efficiently compute amplitudes and also to try to see if this geometrical framework can be extended to other physical quantity that helps us to better understand how particles interact. In the massless particle case, instead, a classical wave is composed of a superposition of many massless particles. For example, many photons, the light is composed of many photons. So what you need to consider at the quantum level is the so-called co uh, coherent state, which is the quantum uh, representation of a classical wave. My work focuses mainly on theories which enjoy a special type of symmetry known as conformal symmetry. What is very nice about these theories is that we can imagine observables to look something like this, namely made of certain basic building blocks which are basically the same for all conformal theories and which are combined in a specific way which depends on the specific theory one is interested in. My work, in particular, focuses on the description and mathematical understanding of these basic building blocks. What the current approach is rather to discovering in physics is to look for really small deviations in the experimental data uh, compared to the prediction from the, the standard model. There's a great need for uh, the computation of these higher order corrections to make sure that we can actually, if there is a, if there is a signal somewhere in the data, uh, we can actually see it. Now using computer algebra tools, it is possible in some cases to compute the closed form of the sum, and then we can revert back to the integral representation, and here the integral will be simplified or even computed. If you have an outgoing uh, set of particles which is different from the incoming one, in this case all these Feynman diagrams or these numbers sum to zero, if the outgoing particle is exactly the same as the incoming one, this uh, Feynman diagram uh, doesn't sum to zero, this uh, sum to one. Uh, this is uh, like a miracle and we would like to understand exactly how this miracle happens in perturbation theory, in quantum field theory. What do you think physicists of future will look about us and today's physics say in a hundred years? <laughs> At the risk of offending physicists, I think it would be arrogant to think that we're the first people who are not wrong. Mm -hmm. At least on some level. Yeah. I Maybe it's an established fact now that Almost any theory you develop is, is an effective theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I hope that in a hundred years, they're going to look at what we did we yeah. did as an effective theory. Yeah. But they're probably going to have some other explanation. Yeah, for me, I just feel like I, I really hope that in 100 years, like the, the future physicists will seem us as just naive and because if they think us naive, that means they have something better. Exactly. That means they have a theory that's better than today. I don't remember who said that much of physics consists of studying the harmonic oscillator over and over again. Repetition, oscillation, these phenomena are everywhere in nature. I like to look at the waves. They have their way of jumping in place onto themselves, but also of propagating in space, generated by some source or by other waves. They are so uncontrollable, so restless. And yet, you know that they obey very simple mathematical laws. A wave extends from way back in space time and moves forward inexorably, with mathematical certainty, its speed and spacing fixed and calculable. It moves colliding, interacting, reflecting on the banks of the river. 
its angle of deflection fixed and calculable. Grappling on top of other waves in an inscrutable dance born from the pull of water and of gravity, forming standing patterns of superposition, hypnotic, ever changing, unrecognizable rhythmic in their pulsation. If only you look, you can see waves everywhere. Wherever there is a fluid, there is a wave. And what is a particle if not an oscillation traveling from a source? a sink. That is actually a very good question. Of course, I asked only good question. Did you ever think of this question before? Not really. Actually, my honest, my honest answer is really that it is invented. Mathematics is a kind of ideal situation which does not, does not really exist in nature. If we were to see what is happening in nature, we, we never get the ideal cases described by mathematics. But this by is function. different. It's different from mass not being that f which you're looking for. It's different than us not being able to get there. Would you still say that it's just us not being able to get there? Or, and that also means that there is no underlying fundamental underlying structure. I just wanted to throw a thought. So if you, by some chance, discover alien life, do you think their mass would vary or deviate from ours? I don't mean the notations and stuff, most likely, of course, but the things they discovered or invented, is it the same? So if it's the same then there's not proof but at least hard points pointing in the direction that Mars is discovered and not invented. What is mathematics? It's an abstract <laughs> concept, right? Which describes what? A set of beliefs or the fundamental nature of things. So if you could magically do an experiment that is impossible with today's technology. Um, what would you wish for? Oh, black hole merger. Oh, black hole merger? Yeah. Oh. If you could like make it in a lab, mm -hmm. make all the measurements and to see it, so you well, mean, not you mean see it again. You mean like micro black hole? I mean, yeah, it would be really cool real if you could hole? see it. If you could actually see it, that would be cool. But I realize that that's... <laughs> uh, so you need, to, you need to be careful, to don't fail into it. Yes, exactly. You will be very into it <laughs> externally. <laughs> if people were scared of CERN, I mm -hmm. think they would be very scared of this. Yeah, experiment. of course. <laughs> Are quarks fundamental? I had an A. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I thought it's a T and I was like, Tre Quark. What's that? Tre Quark. So, you have your question. Are quarks fundamental? Yeah. At the moment, for example, quarks, we, we describe quarks by, by, by point like particles, which don't, you don't have any extension. I, I really wanted to, you to get there. And like like, but you assume that this, the, the, the size of these objects is so small that at our energy scales, it basically behaves as if it was um, something something point like. But so of course, if you no go dimension, to, right? huh? with no dimension, that's with no dimension exactly, with just a. So, but in your mind, I mean, you're doing these calculations every day. How do you imagine a point like particle? This is just an approximation, but how do you imagine a point? I mean, how can you imagine something which is really fundamental, which you're not able to break apart anymore? When it's unfortunately. When it's not going well, when I'm stuck, I think about it all the time. Even when I don't want to think about it. I wake, I dream about it, I wake up and I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about it. It's not necessarily a state of mind I would recommend to anyone. <laughs> but when things are going well, I just, then I'm just happy and I have a glass of wine. After a long week of studying papers, some of which utterly incomprehensible, writing codes, most of which don't work at the end as you would like them to, and attempting calculations just then to discover that someone else already did them, I cannot think of anything better than 
spending the morning at the British Museum and then having a nice picnic at Regent's Park. And then, yeah, maybe going for an ice cream at Covent Garden. There's definitely some good parts of being a PhD in London, specifically. So, it's the 21st week of working from home and this is where I work. This means 21 weeks of sitting 8 hours a day on this thing. So, since there's little chance of getting full time back to work soon, but best case scenario only a couple days a week I will be able to go to the office, I decided to get an upgraded chair for myself. So, I bought this one and I'm really happy about this. Thing is, I already know that it's not going to last that long because in a, I hope so at least in a six months I'll have to get rid of it. I decided to buy, to buy it second hand. But being second hand, I had to go and pick it up myself. And it was really funny traveling with this on the bus in the dedicated wheelchair area with a lot of people smiling at me. It was uh, it was impressive before because I was going for a walk just to you know uh, to 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 keep uh, the mind yeah. uh, in good shape. Yeah. And um, I was impressed to see like the interaction of people because uh, you know the, the park where I'm living here. Yeah. And they have the crossroads. Yeah. And so at certain point you see people they stop and then uh, they wait for the other to go on. Yeah. <laughs> then they start to de deviate and there is one who cuts in the middle of the grass. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Because they don't want, they, yeah. yeah, they don't want to. It's bad to say. It's not. It's not nice. No, I get you. That's life. It's super weird. But yeah. I mean, try to imagine if all of this happened like in the seventies or sixties. Like yeah. uh, no internet, uh, no internet, no Skype, no Zoom. Uh, yeah. Even to work, but I mean, for science, it would have been uh, uh, harder for sure. Yeah. A cut, and, not, <laughs> and not a unitary cut. <laughs> <laughs> You'd really see who the geniuses are. No interaction. No Zoom calls or anything. It's Sunday afternoon. I'm here with Stefano. We had an idea, so even if it's Sunday, we want to look into this. We are looking at gravity, modified gravity, and we want to show that this modification does not affect the amplitude. We wrote this general formula up there, and now we are thinking about an expansion around B, this B parameter here. But we need a non-shell argument, so on the amplitude itself. Why do we need that? We started drawing diagrams and drawing. Yeah, and drawing a little bit more of them. We ended up needing another whiteboard because things get complicated. This is the reason why on-shell techniques are much, much better than <laughs> Feynman diagrams. But no. did we get out of this so far, Stefano? Not so far. Not so far. We will. We, we will. Yeah. Stay confident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I am confident. Very well. If you are, I am too. <laughs> <laughs> so it is October 8th. I am in my tiny little Paris apartment working from home. Still haven't published the paper. <laughs> We're still this close to publishing the paper. Um, yeah, it just seems to be taking longer than I thought it would, but hopefully it'll be worth the wait. Uh, and in the meantime, writing has taken so long that I've actually started writing sort of a follow-up paper of what we want to do, or what we did do with our results. When I'm stuck with something, especially if I'm trying to write something big, when my supervisor is giving me some system that I have to solve, and I have to write down in front of a blank sheet of paper, a blank mathematical file, and I have to start building something big. If I start writing right away, I just sort of act out 
every idea that I have, and then nothing is really well thought through. So when that happens, or when I'm stuck for that matter, I just put on my running shoes, and I run, and I listen to music, and I think, and I get to think out every idea that I have, and every possible solution, and I have to remember it, and I have to go through it, and I have to try to finish the train of thought. Honestly, it's how I've gotten a lot of my good ideas, I would say. It's how I decided to do theoretical physics. I'm pretty sure I was running when I decided I wanted to devote myself to physics to really do as well as I could. And I think it's also just a way to, um, it's gonna sound depressing, to exhaust myself. I feel like I'm mentally tired a lot of the time. So sometimes it's nice to just feel physically tired as well, as like a balance. <laughs> Recently I've gotten really into bouldering, it's something that's really, really nice for staying fit. It's half a physical challenge and half of a sort of mental puzzle. Yeah. Besides from that, I run a lot and cycle a lot, but as well as what, playing these sports, I watch like every single other type of sport. It's crazy, you would not believe. Um, like, yeah, I spend a lot, a lot of time doing extra things. Um, but I think that's really important because I think if I was just working and thinking about my PhD 24 seven, then I would go completely insane. Anna? Awesome. What was your thoughts on the bar yesterday? I heard it was quite expensive. It was expensive. It was quite expensive. Yeah. Ein paar Lied, Lieder? Yeah, it's got a live band. Yeah? Jazz. Yeah, jazz, that's cool, yeah. Ich mag jazz, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been so cool. <laughs> what was the difficulty for uh, women compared to men to do science? Oh, okay. I don't know that there's such a difficulty. I think among young scientists, it, it's not so much of a problem. I think even though the numbers are still low, they're higher than they used to be. So I, I, I think male young physicists are used to female young physicists, so it's not its not a group of men and women, it's just a group of physicists. Okay. But maybe the older scientists haven't, they haven't adapted to the idea that women are also in physics now. So there may be some underlying involuntary, uh, I don't know, preference towards younger, towards young male physicists maybe, but to be honest, it's not, it's fine. Oh, okay. It's fine. So you have a, a positive view of this. I, ha I have a pos yeah, I have a positive view. I, it would be nice if there were more women, of course. But I think the best thing you can do to get more women into physics is to try to be a good female physicist. It's morning in Paris. I'm walking to work, 16 degrees right now, but it's going to be 30 later today, so it's kind of hard to dress for this time. What is one thing that you think is better outside of academia? Well, one thing that I that might be better, depending on the job that you might have, is uh, some kind of mental pressure that you might or might not put on yourself. Because it, this, um, I mean, when you when you're doing your PhD, this is kind of a job that you never truly uh, stop doing during your week. I mean, when when you're working in your office and you keep on like. I mean, you, you study, you work, you, you do your calculations, then you close the key, I mean, you close the key your office, you leave and you go home, you're not truly leaving your job behind you. You you basically keep on thinking about that and thinking and thinking and... I mean, I, I used to have lots of hobbies before a PhD, so I had to leave 
some of them sadly because uh, there is not enough time to do everything and and I think many of them really help in a certain sense to to ease off let off your insistent thoughts that you keep on to on to you Saturday we decided to go to to go to bike by around the city and uh, here there is also Gabriel, my little baby, and uh, the weekend. I want to say something about the school, Gabriel. What can I say? It was a great school. <laughs> now we need some rest. <laughs> Very intense. No, no. Today is Sunday. I'm not working, but I'm helping. My grandparents with the olive harvest. Alberetical trees is never only alberetical trees. So, I'm about four kilometers in there. Uh, there's lots of people in Temple Upper Feld. It's a nice cold day, perfect for a winter run. Uh, gonna do another six kilometers and then do some press ups and pull ups and then head home. Okay, so we're back. Um, ten and a half kilometers. It was pretty slow for the first five or six kilometers, and then a guy passed me actually. And I'm just a really competitive guy. So I kind of let him go past me a bit and then I sped up again and passed him. And then this guy, he, I think he was competitive too because he stayed behind me the entire time for the rest of the run. You know, physics is made by talent. We always have this idea of, no. But according to you, how much is important also like uh, social relations, social aspects, uh, let's say politics in uh, science? Even if we separate the social aspect from the politics. The social aspect is extremely important because none of us can do this on our own. Um, we need interaction with other people, we need to discuss our ideas, we need to uh, give and take so that we can, even just like hearing yourself say something out loud uh, helps you reflect on it, it helps you think about if it's actually a good idea or not. So even apart from the politics, it's really important to talk to other people, to expand your horizons, learn from them, teach each other, and science is a collaborative thing at the end. So it's impossible to take away the social aspect. The, the political aspect, however, is a little bit um, more unfortunate. It, it makes sense because of how much competition there is and how many people there are that you need to know people and you know people who know people. And then I guess how you get positions is why. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a network. Um, and it's very important. It's hard, it's, hard to, it's hard to understate, I think, how important it is. You can be extremely talented and not know the right person. I don't believe there is anything important that uh, I can say to the next generations, but uh, at least I can share my experience. Um, what is important for me is that, uh, that I've learned, and that I didn't know, is that science, specifically physics, is about human interactions. So um, you will see a lot of things in uh, science and in physics uh, which are very similar to those that you could see in uh, uh, real life. The fact that sometimes there is chemistry, sometimes there is not, and there is no real explanation for that. And the second one, I, which also I think it's relevant, is to be aware that the fact that uh, you know physics exists in terms of bubbles. So you will see this so-called community uh, where they uh, make their own conferences, uh, they cite among themselves, uh, and uh, this is of, it's natural. It's natural, of course, but it's going to create a horizon and you won't be able to see what is beyond that bubble. So be aware of these uh, you know, boundaries or, or, um, on knowledge and try always to go outside the bubble. Try always to see things from a different perspective. Try to be original even if people will look at you in a bad way. The third one is actually a wish. Don't look at yourself as a soldier or as a, you know, a little pound in a chessboard uh, um, which can only do a uh, small step uh, one by one. And um, try to look at you as uh, someone that is doing 
physics that is doing science, not as a, you know a student who is doing a, a PhD in academia. Forget about uh, uh, these uh, things. This is just a construction. I you know if you think uh, um, you know uh, people like Maxwell or Einstein, they didn't uh, you know have a PhD. I mean simply because there was no PhD at the time. And I'm quite sure that if you wait 100 years by now, there won't be any PhD. What remains untouched, however, is the fact that we are doing science, we are doing physics. So I hope that you will uh, remember these uh, things and uh, wherever you will go, I hope you will have the opportunity to do science with freedom. So uh, what I want to talk about today is the freedom that comes with being a PhD student. This morning I actually woke up very early and since I was feeling quite rested I decided that I would come to my office and start working. I think I arrived here at 5.30 or something and luckily no one was here. <laughs> but I think this is a clear example of how much freedom one has while being a PhD in reshaping the working schedule. I think very few jobs can give you this great amount of freedom in how much you want to work, when you want to work, yeah, maybe also how you want to work. But at the same time, this kind of freedom comes with a cost. No one tells you when to work, how much you should work, and where's the limit, uh, both in the minimum and in the maximum sense. So, I would like to tell you how I had an idea for a paper. This is actually a, a personal story. I mean, everyone has his own uh, way to uh, develop an idea or to uh, write uh, an article. And in my case, it's very funny. That's why I wanted to, to you know, tell you the stories, because uh, it all started with a walk. So, this is uh, the area when uh, I had uh, the idea. It's uh, near uh, Nihaven in uh, Copenhagen and I was just walking by uh, this area when I noticed uh, uh, far away a boat and uh, what uh, you know uh, uh, got my attention was the particular shape created by the boat in the water and these are called shock waves and uh, I got immediately fascinated by these uh, very simple things and uh, I was obsessed I wanted to know everything about it and I discovered that it's uh, ubiquitous in nature uh, you can find uh, shockwaves generated by boats, but also by airplanes, even in a, a galactic environment. And uh, I, of course, tried to use everything I knew from amplitudes so as to study this uh, uh, topic. And then uh, I had a paper simply starting from this. Considering the uncertainty basically that comes with working or like starting in the field of, of physics like what's kind of your kind of point of view on long-term career plans especially like the uncertainty of ever getting like a real full-time position so this is like something that that really like that you worry about a lot and you try to try to make plans for or is it something you just like kind of try to ignore for the moment and yeah no it's, it's definitely something i think about at the moment the idea of having to go from postdoc to postdoc for like uh, six to eight years before maybe not even getting a professor or a professorship somewhere, it does worry, uh, worry me a lot and I know towards the end of my PhD I'm definitely going to have to think very hard if I want to kind of take that next step into a postdoc um, or to kind of uh, be happy with my PhD, be happy with my time in physics and uh, just go, go and work for a, a, in a normal job. So where I can, you know, because obviously I think about, you know, if, if I ever want to start a family at some point, you know, it's kind of very difficult, um, this um, postdoc lifestyle to, to, to do that. So there are a few things that I want uh, to uh, say to anyone who is interested in uh, pursuing a career in uh, physics. And I want to point out some aspects which are an open secret. Now, one uh, untold truth is that um, when you will 
do uh, physics and you will start your PhD, um, you you will you will find that uh, a lot of your friendship, a lot of your relations, uh, they will simply die off, and uh, it will be extremely complicated to keep up with all the people that you know and love. The reason is because we're constantly asked to uh, travel, to be uh, in a foreign country. And so this is uh, uh, an open secret that we all complain about. Uh, it's about relations, but it's about also love. I mean, uh, if you love someone, you would like to be uh, with that person for a lot of time. And um, even in this case, it's very complicated. So, uh, this is the so-called Jubilee problem, the non-gravitational one, um, which can really discourage a lot of people. Driving in the Norwegian mountains in typical mountain weather. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to see mountains, actually just see fog and rain. It's lovely. So it's Friday morning I would say it's 10 19 which is usually the time I would show up at the office on an early day um, but I've already been here for two hours because I'm in Trondheim visiting my boyfriend who lives here I'm working on um, a problem that has been ready to publish since I don't know I would say November We've been just around the corner from publishing since November, I think. Um, but every time we're almost done, I just do one last check and then something breaks down or I discover that something wasn't working in the first place. Um, but hopefully, hopefully, we're sort of close to finishing now. I'm just running the last uh, checks and it takes time and it's tiring and I just want to publish something. <laughs> So today is the 18th of November, I'm still in Venice, trying to complete a paper with my supervisor. Because of all this COVID situation, I have to help a lot of my parents with various stuff. I'm taking care of my sister dog, and so I have to interrupt my work very often during the day. I think it's very beneficial for my work. not working out the detail of a solution but uh, I'm I can think about different ideas and uh, strategies to attack the problem for example this uh, Sunday I had to move some heavy stuff with the boat for my parents I had to take them from Venice to the Lido which is another island of the Lagoon of Venice. I had time to, to think of one of the problems that we are working on and I came up with a couple of stuff to try and I, when I came home, they, they were working. So <laughs> it was very nice and that's it. Hope to finish this paper soon and before Christmas. Let's see how it goes. Some would say this is a little bit crazy and they would probably be right, but the good coffee is at the coffee place that's about 400 meters on the other side of a bridge. And to me, it's worth crossing the blizzard for the good coffee, because I need the good coffee to do the good work. So that's physics priorities. So it's November 19th. Uh, we finally managed to publish the paper. I somehow thought that once the first paper was out, I was going to feel this enormous relief and just feel like celebrating. But I think I also thought it was going to take less time than it did in the end from the moment we thought we were finished until we put it out. I think it took about eight months or something. So the excitement kind of wears off, but it was still a big moment. 
totally worth it. <laughs> so now things have kind of slowed down. I'm, I'm applying for postdocs at this point. I guess most of us are. Um, trying to write down a research statement without really knowing what kind of research I want to be doing and um, trying to figure out where we want to move because we're going to have to move a few times if I want to keep doing this. I think I, I want to point out something that I've, I've sort of discovered during this PhD, or the first part of my PhD at least. Um, that I think doing a PhD or maybe even doing a, an academic career is not so much about um, learning uh, your subject, even though of course you do become sort of an expert in learning your subject. I think you become an expert in um, perseverance and patience. I think um, a lot of the time you're sort of alone with your problems and you have to try to solve a problem that you've been trying to solve for three weeks and not getting anywhere and you still have to go to work, sit down and look at that equation one more time and try to think out a solution. Um, so of course I think the smarter you are, <laughs> the, uh, the easier that becomes maybe. But at some point you're always going to sort of hit a wall. So um, I think I just wanted to say that, you know, a PhD is fun and it's, um, you know, you have the liberty to, to play around with the stuff that you like the most. But it does require some mental strength and some patience and, and sort of being able to tell yourself that you'll find the solution in the end. Physics, it's beautiful. I am in love with uh, Revit since I was very young, like I think uh, 11 years old. In doing physics, I always remind myself that I have to try. I have to try to be creative. I have to try to do something new, something which is original. I don't have to get the Nobel Prize. I don't care about these things. I don't have to impress my uh, peers. I don't care about that. I have to find an original idea, something which when I see it, I say it's beautiful. Physics is like heart, so it has to be a creative work uh, where people are encouraged to develop their own way of doing things. It has to be about uh, independence, um, creativity, about uh, doing something different, uh, or at least trying. Okay, at least trying to do something different. This is what to me is physics. And this is what really gives me the strength to uh, uh, wake me up every day and uh, do what I do. Uh, really, it's all about passion. Uh, and I think that it's, it's the most beautiful things.